Hello everyone, I'm Erin Garcia, Director of Exhibitions at the California Historical Society. Thank you for joining our program today, a book talk about Harlem of the West, the San Francisco Fillmore jazz era. Before we begin, I'd like to mention that the California Historical Society was founded in 1871, nearly 150 years ago. Our mission is to inspire and empower people to make California's richly diverse past a meaningful part of their contemporary lives. Currently, we are creating a collection to document life in California during the COVID-19 pandemic. Our archives have consistently shown the power of ordinary people's testimonies in the form of diaries, letters, scrapbooks, and oral histories to enrich our understanding of the past. So we invite you to visit our Tell Your Story portal, which you can find on our website, calhis.org, and tell future generations what it's like to live in California right now. Today's program is a talk with Elizabeth Pepin Silva and Lewis Watts about their book, Harlem of the West, the San Francisco Fillmore Jazz Area, which they published in 2020 with Heyday Books. Based on an earlier edition and a traveling museum exhibition, the book resulted from decades of research, on the ground investigation, and oral history gathering by the two authors. Elizabeth Pepin Silva, a journalist by training, is a writer, photographer, and filmmaker. Her decades of research into the Fillmore and its jazz scene began in the late 1980s when she took a job as historian and day manager of the Fillmore Auditorium by Bill Graham Presents. She has been writing about the neighborhood ever since. Louis Watts is a photographer, archivist, and professor emeritus of art at UC Santa Cruz with a long-standing interest in African-American visual history. In 2013, he published New Orleans Suite, Music and Culture in Transition. His artwork has been exhibited or collected by major museums across the country and abroad. Their book charts the emergence of the Fillmore's thriving jazz scene in the 1940s and 50s and its demise during the redevelopment wave of the 1960s. It's a beautiful book. You can purchase it on the Heyday Books website, heydaybooks.com. And so with that, let me turn it over to our guests, Elizabeth Pepin Silva and Louis Watts. Thank you both so much for joining us. Thank you. Thank you. We're, we're really thrilled um, to be uh, uh, doing this with the Historical Society because they've been very supportive and we've had actually a number of very successful uh, programs during the history of this book, which we'll talk about in the, uh, during this program. Um, I think, are we ready to start? We have some uh, images to look at and I think that may be the best way to begin. Let's see. So I actually, I first heard the term Harlem of the West for my, I had a friend whose parents had a nightclub in San Francisco and she talked about they, in, no, in, San, in Los Angeles, she talked about them uh, driving up uh, to the Fillmore, which they referred to as the Harlem of the West. And, uh, and that was actually, I had been there. I'd come to San Francisco in 1964 right out of high school, and um, someone had said, you want to go to the black area of, of uh, San Francisco? And I, not knowing the history, said, sure. And went on a Friday night, and it was jumping. The streets were really crowded, and that was, and that was probably just toward the end of its kind of heyday. Um, anyway, let's get to the history of this neighborhood. So the neighborhood was built because downtown and the Civic Center area started to become very crowded. And so city leaders looked to the neighborhood that was close, or I should say the land that was closest to downtown in the Civic Center, and that was the Western Edition or the Fillmore. Um, so in the 1870s, people started to build out the Fillmore neighborhood. And as you can see by this photograph here, it became a extremely thriving business district. So much so that after the earthquake, the closest neighborhood to downtown that survived the fire and the earthquake was the Fillmore District. And so the Civic Center and the downtown stores moved to the Fillmore neighborhood for a time while the downtown area was being rebuilt. And so the government offices, department stores, all that um, was in the Fillmore neighborhood uh, 1907, 1908. But by the end of 1908, 
when things were rebuilt, everyone moved back to downtown into the Civic Center and the Fillmore merchants were trying to figure out how can we continue to keep people coming to our neighborhood. And so they decided that they would make the Fillmore District one of the primary areas for um, arts and entertainment. And so you see this proliferation of building of dance halls and vaudeville houses and bars and restaurants and it became one of San Francisco's uh, prime nightclub spots. During this time the merchants also got together and pooled their money to build these illuminated arches with these balls that glowed in the center and it ran down the entire length of Fillmore Street up to California from starting at Hayes. And we were told by people who actually saw them that it was one of the most illuminated streets in uh, west of the Mississippi and it was very beautiful. It was like this uh, glowing uh, street all the way to uh, Pacific Heights. It was, I was going to say, it was also one of the most diverse um, uh, areas of San Francisco. It, um, from during most of the 20th century, it was the Japantown, which was sort of the center of, of where a lot of the Japanese um, lived. And this is actually, I think, a photograph by Dorothea Lang taken at an elementary school in the um, early 40s. And so when, the, well, after uh, Pearl Harbor, uh, uh, Franklin Roosevelt decided that um, the Japanese needed to be uh, moved off the West Coast and interned in other areas. And this is another photograph of um, someone packed up um, at Tamparan Racetrack and um, left. And simultaneously, the shipyards throughout the San Francisco Bay were converting to the war effort um, to, to sort of, and needed people to work. And so the call went out all over the country. And a lot of people from the Midwest, and particularly African Americans from Texas and Louisiana, came West. And as is the case now, housing was always is tight in San Francisco. And in the only place where there was sort of available housing, and also housing that was open to African Americans, was in the Fillmore District, where there had been boarding houses and, um, and regular, uh, a lot of Victorians um, that were available for people to move into. So previous to the war effort, um, the film war was considered one of the most diverse neighborhoods west of the Mississippi. When it was first built, it was primarily a Jewish neighborhood, but as racial covenants, which were in deeds of houses, not only in San Francisco, but throughout the Bay Area that restricted uh, both people of color and Jewish citizens from living outside of certain neighborhoods, as those were lifted for uh, Jewish citizens and they could move out to the suburbs, um, other people began to move in. And so you see this rich diversity in the neighborhood very early on. Japanese Americans, African Americans, there is a, a Filipino American area in the film or mainly along Webster Street. Um, so it was extremely diverse. And in fact, pre-World War II, the very first jazz club in the film or opened up in 1932. It was owned by an African American couple and it was called Jacks of Sutter. And thus the beginnings of Harlem of the West began. So when um, African Americans settled, um, there was already kind of infrastructure and almost immediately people came from the South primarily and they brought with them uh, religious practice, musical taste, uh, and a variety of other things. Um, uh, and um, they almost immediately, um, uh, restaurants, um, hotels, converted ownership, and a number of jazz clubs almost opened up immediately. And, and I think that was the roots of the name because it, it sort of was the closest thing. Although we, we've heard of other communities in parts of the country also called Harlem of the West. And one of the things that happened was a number of photographers, um, many of them self-taught, uh, were able to make a living by documenting what was going on in the clubs. Um, when um, I had, uh, 
a very good friend of mine, Mildred Howard, who's a, a Bay Area um, artist, had said, I want you to go to um, a shine parlor on Fillmore Street. This was in probably the uh, early 90s. Because, um, A, I think you'll be interested, and I'm also doing a piece about um, shoe shine parlors, and I want you to document it. So I went to Red uh, Powell's Shine Parlor, which is actually on in the first block south of Geary at this point. Um, uh, and when I went in, his walls were filled with photographs of uh, a variety of things. If you see behind him, there's pictures of uh, Bobby Kennedy and Joseph Stalin and Sitting Bull and Bobby Freeman, who was a rhythm and blues star from the Bay Area. And, and then also pictures of people from the community and other musicians and people who had passed through. And so I got really excited and said, wow, can I photograph? And he I said, absolutely not. And basically <laughs> threw me out. Um, and I think Elizabeth had the exact same uh, experience, even though we didn't know each other then. And it turns out um, that he had, you know, he was very suspicious and bitter because he had had to relocate four or five times and was very suspicious of anybody sort of uh, coming in that he didn't know expressing interest. So, um, you know, it's the funny thing about this book has been, uh, we both have found out that both our memories and other people's memories are moving objects. And I always like to think I came back um, uh, Mildred's brother knew Red and said, just mention me and you'll be fine. And I like to think I came back pretty soon, but I think it was probably six months, maybe even a year. And when I came back, he was gone and the walls were bare. And I remember asking someone, do you know what happened um, to the shine parlor? And someone said, someone said, I, they thought someone had rescued the photographs, but they didn't know any more about it. So later I was hired by um, a colleague of mine at UC Berkeley, because the redevelopment agency was sort of putting out bids to make a jazz preservation district in this neighborhood that all traces of this past had been erased from. And, um, uh, and I'd been asking people, but in the source of doing research to sort of gather materials, I remember asking people um, if they knew what had happened to Red and his pictures. And I was across the street at the barbershop, New Chicago barbershop, and Reggie Pettis, the barber, said, oh, they're in my back room. And I got really excited about it. And he was excited, unlike Red, that, um, you know, I was interested in it. And it turns out Red had had a stroke very, not too long after um, I uh, uh, saw him. And he, um, uh, I think his son tried to take over for a while, but basically the landlord came in when it was empty and had started to take the photographs off the wall and was about to throw them out. And Red, uh, I mean, uh, Reggie, um, like other barbers and beauty parlors and mortuaries in the black community is a uh, archivist. And he was able to negotiate with the um, landlord for, to get the photographs. And they had been sitting in his um, back room uh, since he had rescued them. And so uh, I, he said I could use them for this report I was doing. Um, and uh, some of them were really immaculate and some of them in really bad shape. And um, I actually, this was my opportunity to really learn and use Photoshop. I, had, I was teaching, but basically teaching darkroom um, photography. Um, and I had a couple of students who did know Photoshop were ahead of me. And I remember a student who had, one of my go-to people said, well, you need to do this yourself. So when I had something I was invested in, I was able to learn how to um, scan and restore photographs. And that's actually what happened here. And that actually this, this project sort of changed my own practice and changed kind of the thrust of my photographic career. So, uh, and my archival career for that matter. So these are m um, mostly images from um, the community and from and what happened was a number of people when the redevelopment agency sort of closed uh, businesses and made people move because people knew Red sort of had, was uh, interested, they gave, a number of people gave him their uh, collections of photographs. And I think what, what it really is illuminates this incredible um, uh, kind of insight into what life was like in the 50s you know, it was a big thing for men to get their hair processed. You can see the jars of lard in the back of this um, barbershop. 
So when I um, came into the Fillmore uh, to work at the Fillmore Auditorium in 1986, um, Bill Graham had me research the history of the building um, as part of my job. And so in researching um, the building, which was built in 1911 by a woman and her two daughters, uh, I began to uncover the history of the neighborhood, which I found even more fascinating, frankly, than the history of the Fillmore Auditorium. And I couldn't believe that there had been this vibrant African-American neighborhood um, with more than 20 nightclubs um, at its height that there was almost no trace of. And like Lou, I read Shoeshine Parlor in its fifth location because the redevelopment agency kept moving it as they were tearing down buildings. I went across the street um, on Fillmore Street where it was located across from the Fillmore Auditorium and tried to talk to him because it was literally one of the few places left um, from the Harlem of the West era and like Lou was thrown out. So as I, when I finished the booklet for Bill Graham Presents, I then wanted to know more about uh, the musicians and the nightclubs. And so I, I tried to find things in the library and the California Historical Society and other um, archival resources that you would generally turn to. But unfortunately at that time, the collections didn't have much from this neighborhood. And of course that certainly has changed. California Historical Society and the library has a very robust collection now. But at the time they, that wasn't available. And so I simply started walking um, around the neighborhood and walking up to people who looked old enough to have experienced uh, the heyday of Harlem of the West in the 1940s and 50s and early 60s and asking them. And that's how um, we were able to meet so many of the people who later became our uh, contributors to the oral histories, as well as uncovering many of the photo collections beside the uh, Red Powell Reggie Pettis collection. So uh, after I kind of uh, started preparing some of these photographs for the report, Actually, my friend Rupert Jenkins, at, who was then at the San Francisco Art Commission, said, well, you need to show these. And um, so I put together kind of an initial collection, mostly from Reds and from a couple of other photographers. Um, and they showed outside of Willie Brown's temporary office, actually in the Veterans Building, when the uh, City Hall was under construction. And I remember at the opening, first of all, Frank Jackson, who is uh, one of the musicians, um, I think well, I had met and he came and played. And I also met a, a young woman who had said she'd worked for Bill Graham and had done all this research about the club, and it was Elizabeth. And we both, I think at that point, said, gee, we need to do something about this. Um, and then I think she, and then she got hired as the associate um, producer of a documentary that KQED was doing about the neighborhood. And that, um, uh, the research for that film actually also yielded a number of the, um, people and it certainly broadened the collection of images we had access to. I was going to say this is Bicycle who was a vaudevillian performer and he's in front of a uh, movie theater. What's the theater, Elizabeth? See, this is Elizabeth is good for names. Can you remember? Um, it is the new Fillmore Theater. Thank you. Okay. Um, what I thought was interesting, eh, his aesthetic is actually very much like Flavor Flav, uh, kind of a hip-hop fame. And then the other thing is a lot of these photographs had no dates or anything, but we can kind of see that the bill seems to be maybe Korea a era um, movies. And this is like, this theater was sort of like the Apollo in New York where you would go and for not very much money, you see a live show and a double feature film. And, and the other thing, you know, just that um, it was interesting to sort of see what life in the bars, like the kind of beer that they were drinking or the, the aesthetic of the spaces, and most importantly, the suits and the way people were dressed. The people really did dress to go to the film more. So this is Jacks of Sutter. This is um, the club that I was talking about earlier. Um, and it was the first uh, jazz club in the Fillmore District. Again, 1932, it was on uh, Sutter Street. And as you can see, impeccably dressed 
uh, gentleman, even the bartender looks great. On the left, you have uh, little Robert Lee, who was known as the player of players. Um, apparently, he could procure you anything that you might need for an evening out. And, uh, they, you know, there are a number of people that were still kind of living when we were doing this research. And I remember I probably tried to meet with him four or five times, and he kept always putting me off and said his car was in the shop. And then he passed, and we unfortunately had a, a number of those stories, because he actually appears in a number of these pictures. This is in the basement of the, uh, the Booker T. Washington Hotel. And this is, seems to be a meal, maybe a breakfast of luminaries. And if you notice the second person from the left is Ella Fitzgerald. And next to her is little Robert Lee. And next to him is Don Newcomb. And next to him is Joe, pa John Newcomb was a picture for the both the Brooklyn and the Los Angeles Dodgers. And next to him was Joe Perry, who's a running back for the 49ers. And there's a couple of things I really love about this photograph. A, the rug is incredible. Um, Ella's gloves, white gloves are neatly folded on her purse. And the gentleman on the right has these really great Argyle socks. So it's kind of like a number of things going on. And this is illuminating um, something about life and the fact that this really was a cultural center in San Francisco. This is another black owned hotel, the Manor Plaza. And here's a picture of Duke Ellington charming the ladies um, at the, with a, a gathering of people. And the reason why these hotels um, had such luminaries is that uh, Ella Fitzgerald was allowed to play downtown at like the Fairmont or the other large hotels and venues. But African Americans, even if you were famous like Ella Fitzgerald, were not allowed to stay in the hotels um, in the downtown area. And so they, they would play for a white audience, it was completely segregated, and then they would come back to the Manor Plaza or to the Booker T. Washington, and they would stay in the Black-owned hotels and play in the Black venues in the neighborhood. This is actually a photograph of Louis Jordan. You see the poster on the window. That's him second from the right with his wife, and in, next to him is little tiny, there's always these DJs, always big DJs always have things like that. And then next to him was a couple who were the owners of the Manor Plaza Hotel at one point. And they also own the Premalon Ballroom. Oh, yes. Yep. That's what was on to. So um, th one of the photographers we met was David Johnson, who actually came to San Francisco uh, in the late 40s to study with Ansel Adams at what, was, what became the, the Art Institute. And he, uh, this is a picture of him. He's still one of the, he's one of the, actually the only living photographer right now. And this is on his 95th birthday. Um, he's become a really good friend and mentor to me and um, a really wonderful gentleman. And he um, took this great picture uh, from, I think it's from Post, looking south on Geary in 1949, 8 of 49. And if you look at the uh, end of the street, is the Fillmore Auditorium, and next to that was, um, wasn't, wasn't that the Odd Follows Hall? It was the and, synagogue, and then the Odd Follows, oh, Follows the, Hall, okay. the kind of whitish building right. to the right. The large the building was a synagogue. It was, um, I don't know if it was one of the first, but it was an early um, synagogue that eventually moved farther west, and um, and then the Odd Fellows uh, building, the white one on the, on the uh, to the right, became Pimple, People's Temple. What happens is when we do these programs is we have, uh, well, actually my colleague and co-author has a much better off uh, uh, memory than I do, but we do have people that help us to correct facts. But it's interesting that Fillmore at that point had streetcars um, and you can kind of see the houses and some of these buildings actually, I don't know if the uh, cut rate, the, the drugstore is no longer there, but it was there till not too long ago. and. Um, there's a number of the bars and things in that block. So after he finished the Art Institute, uh, he opened up a studio um, in the Fillmore. And in fact, it's funny, I just heard from the daughter of a, a family friend and he photographed their wedding, you know, 30 years ago. 
So he was very active in the community. And what we really loved when he found his work was besides photographing in the clubs, which he actually did also, he photographed life on the street. He was really a, a documentary, social documentary photographer. But he did photograph, this is the Primalon Ballroom, which was a roller skating rink during the day, and then more of a rhythm and blues venue at night. And a couple of things that are interesting, it's interesting to see the sort of diversity of the crowd. It's Roy Milton's band that's yes, on stage yes, there. Right. Roy Milton is on the drums. You can tell about this record shop. So when we met David, um, which was uh, during the time that KQD was making the Fillmore documentary, he pulled out this photo um, and told us that it was the Melrose Record Shop. And I was really excited because if anyone has read Maya Angelou's book, I Know Why the Cage Bird Sings, she men mentions the Melrose Record Shop, where in fact she actually worked for a time and I'd never seen a photo of it, so I was really excited to finally see a photo. Um, and one of the interesting things uh, about working on this project for so long is that as time has passed, um, you know, the internet was invented and subsequently more and more things have uh, become available digitally. And so we're able to start uh, not only relying on people's memories, but also on documents that have been um, digitized. And so I had always tried to find copies of the Sun Reporter, which was the African American newspaper started in 1946 out of the Fillmore neighborhood. But I was not able to initially find any of the older copies. And so finally UC Berkeley digitized um, their stash of Sun reporters. Um, so I was able to get an interlibrary loan and I sat in our local library using their microfilm uh, machine for three months reading every issue from 1951 until 1960. <clears throat> and in that I was able to find out that David Rosenbaum, the gentleman who owned uh, Rhythm Records and the Melrose Record Shop had a second record shop Rhythm Records. And in fact, Rhythm Records was the first record shop. And I found out that this photo was actually taken in front of Rhythm Record Shop due to being able to um, research it in the newspaper. So it was really exciting to finally know that this was actually Rhythm Records. It was on Sutter, just a few doors down from Jacks of Sutter, which makes sense because he, uh, David Rosenbaum had a ready audience they come into the record store and then go see um, jazz music at Jacks of Sutter. <clears throat> so we, we just really loved that kind of, um, he was telling sort of a, a, a broader story and more of a documentary story in his photographs. And um, he had actually, I think, had stopped uh, photographing for a while and this, the book and this sort of gave, re, helped him reignite. And he's since his work has gone into the Library of Congress and his, his archive are in the Bancroft Library at UC Berkeley. And he, along with his wife, Jack, Jacqueline uh, Annette Sue, uh, published this amazing book of his uh, early work. So uh, I always kid him that I'm responsible for his career, and he knows it's not true, but we, we have a good joke about it. And he really is an incredible, uh, sharp, and um, uh, generous man. So one of the things that um, many of the uh, nightclubs in the Fillmore did, as Lou mentioned earlier, is that they would have, it would be a night out for a show. So you would have these, uh, maybe a comedian or a vaudeville act, then you'd have these dancing girls, you just saw a photograph of one of the dancing girls, and then you'd have um, dinner and then the band would play and perhaps there would be dancing. So there was several, several places like that, uh, the California Theater, um, which before World War II was a Japanese owned uh, supper club called Cherryland, um, and you had the Champagne Supper Club and several other venues around the Fillmore that were these very formal 
uh, venues where you would have an entire evening out. Uh, this again is Jack's of Sutter, also known as Jack's Tavern sometimes. And it's actually one of the few night, actually the only nightclub that remained up, into, up to this day. It's now called the Boom Boom Room. Um, it was moved by the redevelopment agency in the 60s from its location on Sutter because they were tearing down that block of buildings and moved to the corner of Geary and Fillmore, um, where it remained the uh, Jacks of Sutter until uh, the late 1980s, early 1990s, and was changed to the Boom Boom Room at that time. Um, uh, the gentleman on the right is Frank uh, um, Jackson, who, uh, with his trio, who, as I said, we were we thrilled to meet. Um, he had some photographs for us also, and he also has played at a number of events. And I had the honor of uh, going to his, I think, 80th uh, birthday concert at Yoshi's not too long ago, and he's just recently passed. I was always very supportive of the book and excited by it. And this was an interesting a group called the Four Naturals, and they had this kind of motif. Uh, they also had changing keyboardists because Frank, this is one with Frank sitting in with this kind of stylized keyboard. But we were just really interested in kind of A, um, the sort of musicians and, and how they were um, put together and how they would publicize themselves. This is a group we don't know, but I think they're celebrating the release of their record. And there's a couple things going on. You look at the ads in the background. I mean, it, all of this gives a sense of the time. Um, and, uh, and also, again, the way people were, were dressed. Uh, this, it's interesting that this group goes all the way from someone wearing overalls to someone in a really nice suit and a Stetson hat. There was actually a record label out of the Fillmore um, it was again run by David Rosenbaum, Rhythm Records, uh, and lasted until the early 1960s. The film really didn't have its own uh, musical sound per se, um, and a lot of the musician, musicians complained that to really become famous they had to actually leave San Francisco and go to New York or Los Angeles um, to become established, but Rhythm Records existed and a few other smaller 78 labels run out of people's garages um, also uh, were out of the Fillmore neighborhood. So this I is- I love this one. Oh, I'm sorry, go ahead. Um, I was just gonna say, I like this picture because it's two musicians looking slightly uncomfortable because it's daylight. Because <laughs> a lot of people would play till the middle of the night. But this was, I think, given to us by Frank Jackson and I like it. So one of the things that was going on while this amazing, vibrant neighborhood was thriving was this completely different narrative uh, down in City Hall. So redevelopment was something that had been talked about actually as a concept in the 1920s. And it was, you know, clearing out the slums, making everything modern and new, um, but it didn't really get any uh, toehold because first you had uh, the depression and then there was no money, then you had World War II and, so it wasn't really until after World War II that redevelopment began, began to be discussed again. And this was not only going on in San Francisco, this was going on all over the country. So the first redevelopment project in San Francisco was down at the old uh, vegetable market, which is where the Embarcadero Center is now. Produce market uh, redevelopment went great. There was hardly anyone living down there. They were able to clear uh, all the vendors out and move them uh, out by the Bay Shore, and it was a big success. So City Hall then turned its sights onto the Fillmore, um, and you start seeing this narrative in both the Chronicle and the Examiner at this time, couching the neighborhood and you can see this photo of a rather broken looking building of slums, of blight, 
these poor children playing in these roach infested apartments and rubble strewn parks and things like that. But as you saw in these photos that we've been showing you previous to this slide here of the newspaper article, what really was going on was quite different. Those photos were taken by people who lived, worked, and played in the neighborhood, and it depicts what the neighborhood really looked like, despite what the examiner of the Chronicle and City Hall were trying to tell the rest of San Francisco. The other thing was um, uh, there were, pretty obvious, there were people in um, the City Hall and the uh, Beauty Development Agency that were not happy with the fact that a sort of primary uh, neighborhood right in the middle of San Francisco was, was uh, inhabited by African Americans. So going back to some of these really positive pictures, this is uh, actually interesting. Uh, in one of the clubs, um, the new the uh, Sun Reporter uh, around Christmas time, I think it was, would sort of celebrate and have a uh, the uh, newsboys. And this is a picture with Eartha Kitt, and um, you can see she's got her hand on the shoulder of a young man who's just overcome. He's he's overcome, um, but this was like kind of gathering that celebrate the 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 people who delivered the paper and um uh eventually we found out that the person on the left was danny duncan who grew up in the fillmore and is actually now a, a, a well-known actor and playwright and in fact he's working on a musical because his um, family lived in the fillmore and his mother would open up her house after hours as an after hours place that happened a lot because most of the clubs had to close uh, they sold liquor they had to close at two and sometimes earlier and this that was another photograph where we didn't know the location of the photo but when i was able to read the sun reporters and saw the ads for this newspaper boys um christmas party and found out that it was uh, 1953 at the Champagne Supper Club and Teddy Edwards opened for Eartha Kitt, suddenly this photo came to life. I'm like, all oh, right, now we know where this location was and we know what year it took place. So again, it was very exciting to have uh, the availability of, of newspapers digitally that we could refer to. And I think it also points out the fact that these clubs were like cultural centers. They would some, be open in the, sometimes during the day for birthday parties and other things in the community. Um, so they really function in a lot of different levels. This is Danny Duncan taken, what this about, you think, five or six years ago? Yeah, we did um, it five years we, ago. Yeah, we were interviewing him. Um, and and um, he's also been very supportive. Um, and in fact, we didn't know who he was until uh, later. I think David Johnson had an exhibit in San Francisco and he showed up and we were really happy to meet him and I, um, I'm looking forward to maybe doing, we'll be doing some things with him when he, his uh, musical opens up. So he let us uh, have his, some of his family archives, that's again his, with his siblings on the right. Well, I think this is one of those hand colored photographs from the 50s. Um, this is the, uh, a school that was in the Fillmore in 1951, it's really funny. This looks very much like the a photograph of the elementary school I went to in Seattle, which had a very similar kind of demographic, um, same thing, the sort of the offspring of people who would come west during, uh, after, during and after World War uh, II. The picture of his mother um, in the house where she uh, would open up for, for um, parties. Yeah, and his, um, Danny's father built all those banquets, the, the chairs right there, and it was in the basement of their Victorian. So this is actually an interesting photograph that I think was in Red Powell's collection. And we were very, well, we were interested in it because what happened was after the war, um, uh, many, but not all, there's some Japanese did not come back west. They were really there, but people did come back. And, and the question was, so what happened with the older residents and the new residents? And this is a really interesting uh, wedding party picture. And you can see um, kind of who's in the wedding party and the fact that people did, um, they were, they was some people were welcomed back. I mean, there were some adjustments and things and some people having to deal with 
um, you know, who own property. But on the other hand, um, especially because of the sort of restrictions in other parts of San Francisco, people were getting along. And I hope Elizabeth remembers the name of the playwright, but someone said that a, a, a playwright who now um, teaches at UC Berkeley um, said this photograph was one of the inspirations for a play he did after the war, which I think originally was a straight play at ACT, and then he eventually actually made it into a musical also. Do you remember his name, Elizabeth? Or are you gonna uh, <laughs> Philip Cont Contando, is that how you say his I name? I think that's right, yeah. yeah. Um, one of the interesting things, again, about this photo is that it's at Jackson's Nook, which was across the street from Bob City. It was a jazz club and mm -hmm. bar at night. But as Lou pointed out earlier, a lot of these jazz clubs during the day were rented out to people in the neighborhood. So you have this uh, wedding reception taking place in this African-American jazz club. So actually, uh, Elizabeth was saying a lot of um, musicians had to leave town. One of the people who actually had a national hit was Saunders King, who um, lived in San Francisco. And um, he was sort of able to use his, that as a base and was, it was had, a, a, as I said, a big hit and traveled the country. Um, and uh, his, his um, um, daughters, um, actually have also been very generous. Um, his, his daughter Deborah is, was a, is the former wife of Carlos Santana and in fact I think um, there's a number of people who did interviews between Carlos and Saunders talking about the kind of legacy of the blues. And he kept playing up until his death. He sort of played all the way through. He was the house band for at Jackson Sutter for many years as well. So we had heard about some of the clubs, and, and I think this was actually in Red's collection, um, a picture of the gold mirror. And we had heard that um, um, a woman had bought it and then changed it to the blue mirror. And um, we were told that she, had, at one point, had been one of the wealthiest women in San Francisco, certainly one of the wealthiest black women. And her name was Loyola King. And um, uh, it's funny that when we were first um, kind of researching the book, which was originally published by Chronicle Books in 2006, and actually before that, for the, the documentary, um, a number of people we, we heard about, we would approach and they would say, including Loyola, said, oh, she had lost all her pictures in the fire and was not, it could not help us. It was, uh, you know, she was very nice, but she did not know who she, we were. So when that Chronicle book edition came out, um, she, we heard from her that she really loved it. Um, and she let, she let us use her archive, which went into later editions and to the exhibit. So these are most of the pictures from the Blue Mirror, which I don't think had music, but was a really a incredible gathering point. And it actually, it did sometimes. Here's a picture of the Mills Brothers with their father uh, in performance there. Blue Mirror actually did have music and they had a very popular uh, blues evening called Blues Monday. And uh -huh. if you go on our website, harlemofthewestsf.com and go to the video section, we have a link to a YouTube video of Lowell Folsom playing in the Blue Mirror. Um, unfortunately, it's very, very hard and nearly impossible to find moving footage of the Fillmore District in the 40s and 50s. And this clip filmed in the Blue Mirror of Lowell Folsom and his band playing um, is one of the only clips that I've seen inside one of the nightclubs. There used to be another um, clip of, of another blues band playing in the Blue Mirror, but that has been subsequently taken down and I've not been able to find it since. But if you'd like to see what the inside of the Blue Mirror looked like and hear one of the bands play, you can go to our website and watch that on YouTube. And here's Louis Armstrong and his wife um, at, at the Blue Mirror. Here is, uh, 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 Lena Horn signing an autograph for someone. Again, look at uh, the, the, the woman is she's signing for may be better dressed than she is. It's pretty interesting. 
Edward G. Robinson. I mean, it really was a gathering spot um, in San Francisco. What was amazing about the Blue Mirror too is that the Blue Mirror, um, or when it was the Gold Mirror, uh, the Fillmore Auditorium um, and other venues, they were actually segregated mm -hmm. until uh, after the war. I mean, the Fillmore yeah. Auditorium wasn't, you, a person of color was not allowed in the Fillmore Auditorium until the early 1950s. Um, the Blue Mirror uh, allowed anyone in after it was changed from the Gold Mirror. The Gold Mirror was a white only club. So even within the Fillmore, which was supposed to be one of the most diverse neighborhoods in the country, you see this racial segregation going on that, um, you know, shows that San Francisco, while definitely better than places in the South, still had a, a lot of racial segregation well into the late 1950s. There's a picture of Leola with her mother in her um, mansion um, on Scott Street in San Francisco. And here she is with uh, Josephine Baker. In fact, she, when she, she gave me this picture and said, can you uh, erase the gentleman in the middle? She wanted to just have the picture with her, her and Josephine. And here she actually is with Wesley Johnson and um, a club and um, uh, Lottie the Body, who's the blonde on the right, who we'll see a little more later. But this was actually a going away party for um, Lottie, who was about to go on tour, I think, to Japan. But again, we sort of see evidence. Everybody was really having a good time. They looked good. And it really was um, a kind of uh, amazing sort of period. So that was taken at the Texas Playhouse. Right. And here's Leola uh, later in her life. She was beautiful up till the end. She also fought the redevelopment agency up until the end. So the redevelopment agency, um, as Lou pointed out, she was once one of the wealthiest women in San Francisco and lost everything because the redevelopment agency took all of her properties, gave her very little compensation, and she did not go down without a fight and in fact was fighting them till the day that she died trying to get compensated fairly for the properties that the redevelopment agency took her son tony who um, divides his time between san francisco and southern california has actually been working on a book and screenplay about her life which i hope will happen so you saw the blonde in the earlier picture this is um uh, Lottie the Body, who was uh, one of the exotic dancers who would perform in the clubs. And here she, you see her with uh, uh, T-Bone Walker in a club. It's at the Champagne Supper Club, which is where she was the premier dancer um, of the club. And I guess this is that same party at the Texas Playhouse. And the gentleman on the right was her husband, uh, Metal Arc Lemon, who are the Glo Globetrotters. Um, and, and in fact, gosh, no, probably, Goose Tatum. what's that? It, he, she was married to Goose Tatum. I'm sorry, Goose Tatum, ooh, I'm getting my Globetrotters knowledge mixed <laughs> up. I'm sorry about that. Um, uh, we actually got, I got an email from her looking for Elizabeth probably about 10 years ago, and we've been trying to find her, and we turned out that she was in, uh, she had moved to Detroit. And in fact, we set up a time we were going to go visit her, and then she had to postpone because she was going to the burlesque, the convention of burlesque dancers in Las Vegas and being honored, you know, as a kind of uh, pioneer in that area. And so, but we did eventually um, get to meet with her. And again, she was very, um, both excited and very um, uh, generous with her archives and pictures. And here she is with Elizabeth. We, were, we really had a great time. And she just passed recently. We were very sad to hear that. So one of the other clubs um, was originally the club Flamingo. And it was bought by Wesley Johnson, um, who had arrived from Texas. And he changed the name to the Texas Playhouse. And again, like I said, there were a lot of, um, there was also the New Orleans Swing Club, but there was a lot of reference to both Texas and Louisiana because that's where a lot of the people would come from. And um, 
uh, I think Wesley is a second from the uh, left on this. And I think Elizabeth and I were doing a neighborhood talk in the Fillmore and there was a gentleman who was kind of in the crowd. And a couple of times he, you know, corrected some um, uh, things that we had stated. And at the end, we sort of said, so uh, who are you? You know, we were really curious because he looked like he really knew. And it turned out he was Wesley Johnson uh, the third. He was Wesley's son um, who actually had uh, gone to UCSF pharmacy school and opened, had a, a number of drugstores in the Bay Area. And even though he corrected us, he said he really liked what we were doing and let us use his father's um, archive. It turned out his, his Red Pal had gotten some of his father's images but um, he had a whole other collection. And in fact, we've been in touch with his, da his daughter um, um, uh, and we've been trying to help maybe get some of these archives into uh, libraries. But his trademark was this white Stetson hat. So they didn't have music at the uh, Texas Playhouse right. Club Flamingo. It was simply Wesley doing some sort of uh, spiel with a microphone while he uh, played records um, on a record player. And you can see that references to Texas musicians. And um, it's interesting, like a number of uh, clubs I've seen other places, he had collected sort of dollar bills behind the bar as well as in like silver dollars. And uh, when his son, needed tuition money for the uh, tuition at UCSF, they took some of these, this money down to pay. But here Wesley, you are, yeah. I'm sorry, yeah. Wesley actually had also a club um, in North Beach called the Subway Club, which later became the Purple Onion. So he ran the Subway Club first, and then sold that and then came to the film where that's when he bought um, the Club Flamingo and turned it into the Texas Playhouse. Again, this sort of, what, and sort of looking at all these uh, gentlemen in their incredible sets and hats um, has led me to start a start collecting hats myself. Uh, it really is a, um, a particular time and, and really what we were told is you did not set foot in the Fillmore during the weekend if you were not dressed to the nines. Here is Wesley with T-Bone Walker and if you look in the background you see these paintings. Um, we'll see, see some more examples of those. This is an ad from that Wesley took out in the Sun Reporter. And here he is with, I think it was Zeke was the name of his bartender. Mm -hmm. And um, you can see that Sammy Peoples was a local musician who had uh, a hit, a Bay Area hit. And we were thrilled at a number of the openings of, of the book launches at the African American Historical Society that Sam Peoples Jr. was able to play. So it's interesting that the sort of tradition has continued and I would say with very few exceptions, people have been very supportive and very excited about the book. The other interesting thing about that photo, Lou, that I want to point out is that on the, um, what would be my left, so by the bartender, that photograph there uh, turned up in Red Powell's collection that Reggie pulled out of the dumpster. So you can hmm. see visually evidence that that photo was once in the Texas Playhouse and then ended up in Red's shoeshine parlor, then rescued by Reggie. Right. So um, we did a couple of, um, I think, installations uh, at, um, on Fillmore Street. And I remember we got an email from someone saying, you know, the paintings are at the Texas Playhouse. I actually have them. <laughs> and it turned out it was Willie O'Ree and um, uh, uh, his, in da they lived in Daly City and his Russian contracting neighbors sort of were um, d dismantling the Texas Playhouse. And I think he's first said, wow, these paintings, I can, um, you know, use the materials for other things. And when he brought them home, his wife said, you can't do that. This is important cultural artwork. And they gave them to their neighbors who had been displaced from the film order, which was Willie O'Ree's um, family. And so, when we eventually started showing this work, we showed it at the um, uh, the 
San Francisco Performance um, Library and Museum, um, we were actually able to show the, the actual paintings that had been, and were also in really good shape. So the other thing was um, my good friend, Tony Broussard, who's a writer, saw this photograph and told us that this was his, her uncle um, who lived in Berkeley, but every weekend they would come into the Fillmore uh, with his sweetheart. Um, and there, there they are at the Texas Playhouse in front of that same painting. And so it's been really interesting that the imagery has generated a variety of kind of extended stories, which has been really exciting. Another person who spent a lot of time in the Fillmore was Billie Holiday. This is actually a picture by Jerry Stoll, who was the official photographer for the Monterey Jazz Festival, but was in San Francisco. And a couple of things, when that chihuahua died, Billy had it buried with her, the uh, mink coat that she was wearing. And there's fellows that hung out, um, this, here she is with Mel Torme. They hung out by the Burger King and they told me that it didn't matter what kind of shape she was in, she was so beautiful that whenever she would walk by, uh, everybody's mouth would fall open and I can believe it. I've been actually collecting photographs of her because she di looks different in almost every picture I've ever seen of her. So that was in Amon's Supper Club, which was on Fillmore Street, just a few doors down from the Texas Playhouse. And here she is with Wesley Johnson. And it's funny, well, it's not funny, but interesting in the background is a poster for Royal, M Roy Milton playing at Tapper's Dance Hall, which was a club in Richmond. So in Oakland and Richmond and Vallejo and of other places where African-Americans had come to work in the shipyards, um, Oakland had a really strong blues scene. And so, uh, as I said, there was sort of evidence and, and uh, uh, of the fact that people brought their musical taste with them. So this was um, the New Orleans Swing Club that was opened by a gentleman that actually had a um, club in the Barbary Coast, so down on Jackson Street. And that happened a l a quite a bit. There was club owners um, like Curtis Mosby and others who had clubs in the Barbary Coast. And when the Barbary Coast was closed, then moved to the Fillmore neighborhood and opened up clubs there. Um, the New Orleans Swing Club didn't last very long. Unfortunately, the owner of the club uh, didn't like to pay his taxes and was doing other dodgy things out of the club. And it was closed uh, in the late 1940s and the owner sent to San Quentin where he passed away. So here's Lionel Hampton wearing Wesley's, uh, you know, white Stetson. And uh, in this picture on the left is um, Charles Sullivan, who was called the mayor of, of Fillmore. Liz will talk more about him. Next to him is uh, Ralph J. Gleason, who was a, a jazz columnist and then eventually wrote um, uh, about the sort of psychedelic scene. There's Lionel. And then uh, was that Jimmy Lyons? who's one of the founders of the uh, Monterey Jazz Festival. And then I think, do you remember who the person is on the right, Liz? That's O'Berry, Barry, another right. DJ. He was another DJ. A great picture. And again, a picture that we sort of found out more about as it went into circulation. So Charles Sullivan, um, as you can see here in this little, uh, basically it was a fanzine that the New Orleans Swing Club put out in the late 1940s with all these different photos and ads. Um, Charles Sullivan came to the Fillmore after opening a club in the mid-1940s in San Mateo, and he quickly became um, one of the largest uh, leaseholders of properties in the Fillmore district. Um, most notably, he took over the lease of the Fillmore Auditorium um, in 1952, uh, the owner of the building who owned the clothing store down in the corner um, was tired of it being a roller skating rink. It was known as the Ambassador Roller Rim. It was a whites only roller skating rink um, and he hated the noise. So he converted it, the Ambassador Roller Rim back to the Fillmore Auditorium and then looked for someone that wanted to book bands and Charles Sullivan um, took the lease and began um, booking bands there. And it was the first time that the Fillmore actually allowed 
people of color into the building. And very quickly, Charles became one of the largest promoters of African-American music west of the Mississippi and started booking uh, tours that would start up in uh, Seattle and in Spokane, come down through Washington State into Oregon, play in Portland at the Crystal Ballroom, and then come into California and either end up in San Francisco or even go down further into Los Angeles. So he was definitely a, a very um, accomplished man. So it's interesting, there was a sort of, a uh, uh, lot of the groups would in some cases have a, a kind of generic poster and then they would print the name of the venue at the top because I remember seeing posters in this style in Seattle and I saw them in New York. Um, uh, John Goddard, who grew up in Mill Valley and eventually had uh, Village Music there, when he was a teenager, um, he was really interested in, uh, had always been interested in music, and he uh, took the bus into uh, San Francisco uh, to the Fillmore Auditorium trying to see Little Richard. And he was both um, fascinated and slightly annoyed by the fact that Little Richard had a left-handed guitarist who was uh, as, if not more flamboyant than Little Richard was. In fact, we heard, it was Jimi Hendrix, and we heard that Little Richard eventually fired Jimi Hendrix for being too weird, which I think is the height of <laughs> irony. But it was an, inter an interesting um, image and kind of a, the, the idea of sort of seeing the reality of that poster that we saw before. Um, the other thing that's happened is that we found all these incredible stories. This is Ricardo Alvarado and his uh, daughter, uh, um, Janet, um, who I actually knew and, and sort of vaguely had known something about him being a photographer, um, actually has, has been gathering her father's archive uh, and he had a traveling uh, exhibit with the Smithsonian, but he lived, he came with the bachelors that, that arrived in um, uh, to the West Coast from the Philippines in the 30s. They basically women were not allowed. And he worked in the Presidio, I think in the kitchen, bought a camera, was self-taught, and ended up documenting life uh, among the Filipino and, and uh, Latinx communities in California, and also photographed extensively in the Fillmore where he lived and with people that he, um, uh, worked with. So some of his photographs also are included in, this is Jackson's Nook. This is actually a house party. Uh, I love, you can sort of see it must have been an eclectic fair of music. And I love the wallpaper. <laughs> and this is actually Thanksgiving in the film, in the uh, Presidio. And there were a number of, um, this is Vernon Alley. There was the Alley family was one of the prominent musician families. Vernon actually um, was one of the few uh, to be able to travel and get an international reputation. Um, and I think he actually came to the first time I showed this work and then died not too long after that. But we did meet his brother, Eddie, who was a drummer in the Bay Area for um, a long time. And, Again, he and his wife were really excited and supportive and gave us um, uh, contributed sort of examples to the book. Here's a picture of him and his wife on their wedding day. And here they are in, who was this probably, you think, uh, early, like about 2005, it might have been earlier than that. This was a celebration of the integration of the Musicians Union. It was funny, the San Francisco Musicians Union did not integrate till I think either late 50s or early 60s, or certainly behind the, the, um, the sort of civil rights uh, push. But it was interesting to sort of both see them. Um, and again, he was always somebody who really supported. So this is Bop City, probably one of the most famous of the jazz clubs in the Fillmore District. It was on post and Buchanan, um, and was originally uh, a Japanese American restaurant. Then um, when Charles Sullivan took the lease of the building, when Japanese Americans were put in internment camps, 
Um, he rented it out to Slim Gaylord, who opened Vout City, but Slim was definitely a better musician than a uh, business person, and one day just took off without telling Charles Sullivan and moved back to Los Angeles, uh, leaving Charles without anyone to run the club. So he had approached Jimbo Edwards, who was working um, down on Van Ness selling cars and said, I heard that you always wanted to open a restaurant and I have this space. So originally uh, Jimbo opened it as a chicken and waffle shop. And there was this unused room in the back and the musicians asked, asked if they could uh, play back there because when the clubs would close um, they wanted to continue having fun and so that's how Bob City was born. So as you can see it says Jimbo's Chicken Basket on the sign at the top and Bob City's uh, inserted underneath because eventually uh, the restaurant kind of went by the wayside and Bob City was was thus born. This is one of the, the tickets for admission. So this, this is, yeah, go ahead. Um, So this is Steve Jackson Jr. And he was the uh, official Bob City photographer. Um, I found out about Steve just by chance and it just goes to show you that if you um, when you're doing history projects if you talk to enough people eventually you're going to uh, just m uncover some incredible archives. So I was taking a cab ride from KQED to the Fillmore and I was talking to a cab driver telling him what we were doing at KQED with the documentary. And he said, oh, I, I used to play cards with this guy that said he was a photographer at one of the Fillmore Jazz Clubs. Let me see if I can get a hold of him. And stupidly, I left the cab without getting his contact information. But luckily, I had given him my card. So a month goes by and I'm kicking myself for not having got the cab driver's information. And the phone rings at KQED. And it's the cab driver and he says, I've, I've tracked Steve down. He's been rather sick, but he lives out in Hunter's Point and he's willing to see you. So I had my husband drive me out there and drop me off. It was 1030 in the morning and he, his wife and him greeted me warmly. And he said, come on down to uh, the garage. So sat me down in front of this table you see here and he poured me a giant cup of uh, jug white wine and uh, had, you know, did the cheers. And I took a small sip and he said, you don't drink a lot, do you? And I said, mm, well, it's 1030 in the morning. And he's like, well, drink up. So I kind of felt like I was being tested. So I take, took a big slug of which was one of the sweetest wines I've ever had in my life. And I guess I passed the test. So he suddenly pulled back the curtains like Monty Hall against the walls here. And it was just filled, as you can see, with boxes and binders and all kinds of, of negatives and photographs and then you see his dark room right here the door behind us and I just could not believe what I was seeing and so when I left that um, afternoon because I spent sort of several hours there just mesmerized I called Lou right away and said you have to come out here and so Lou Lou made a similar appointment and I think you were subjected to the same uh, I had to pass the wine test too <laughs> yes, <laughs> yes. Oh my gosh, but it was incredible because as you're about to see, Steve took some of the most amazing photographs in the club of any archive that we uncovered. That was a jumbo before and here's, if you look in the back on the right, that's Dizzy Gillespie and Miles Davis, um, kind of at the piano, and Milt Jackson and a number of other musicians. So this was, what happens is a lot of musicians that they were playing elsewhere would come, because Jimbo's didn't open till after two o'clock, um, and you had to it's bring your morning. own booze. Was it? 
two o'clock in the morning. Yes, right. Yes, I'm sorry. <laughs> um, and you had to bring your own um, uh, booze. And the other thing is, from these pictures, we always thought it was like huge. Um, it turned out the building during redevelopment, they, they were sort of stopped from tearing down Victorian. So this building was actually uh, put on a trailer and moved to Fillmore in the second block um, north of Geary and be eventually became Marcus Books. So when I remember walking in, we were both sort of shocked at how small it was. This is actually sort of a double exposure that um, Steve took. I think it was the, one, the first ones of color, and maybe because it didn't work, we didn't, he didn't have a lot of examples of color. But um, Elizabeth can talk about this mural. We'll see a little bit more of that in a minute. And they, again, would have these dinner parties, and uh, people from the neighborhood would be invited. So this is Harry Smith. So um, he's very well known as an experimental filmmaker, an artist. He did the folk anthology. He actually lived in Berkeley um, during the late 1940s, and he was absolutely obsessed with jazz. And so he would come over on the streetcar when there was a streetcar that ran um, on the bottom tier of the Bay Bridge from Berkeley to San Francisco to the Fillmore District to see bands play. And he started spending so much time in San Francisco that he moved to a little uh, studio apartment above Jackson's Nook. And then when Bob City opened, he became good friends with Jimbo Edwards. And Jimbo invited him to live in an apartment above Bob City for free in exchange for um, doing murals in um, the interior of Bob City. And so he kind of became Harry's patron. And Harry would do these, would paint the murals while the jazz musicians um, would play. And so he uh, took that to the next level. And you can see here in this article, they actually, um, he went to the Museum of Modern Art in San Francisco and uh, the bands would play while Harry's experimental films um, were shown, which were uh, all hand painted and created while he was listening to jazz music. And he eventually uh, moved to New York and Patti Smith mentions hanging out with him at the Chelsea Hotel. So he was, uh, he's a, uh, and his archive is in the Getty Center in Los Angeles. Here he is. So these are the murals just after he had finished them. And he would stay in, in Bob City all day long, writing and painting, and, and uh, Jimbo would feed him. And, uh, you know, we, we've heard, well, we know, Jack Kerouac and the Beats uh, mentioned going to Bob City, and um, you'll see from other pictures, it really was a hangout. Um, Here's Chico Hamilton playing. It's funny, the, we heard that the, there was a, a, rhythm, a drum and bass sort of there, and most of the bass players hated the bass so much that they would bring their own basses, but um, not always. <laughs> Here's Johnny Mathis, who grew up in San Francisco uh, performing. I think at one point he had to decide whether he was gonna become an Olympic athlete or a singer, and I guess he decided to become a singer. This is a poster for some of the bands and musicians that have played there. Um, Herb Kane wrote about Bop City extensively. Herb was good friends with Vernon Alley. Um, and so when Herb moved to San Francisco from Sacramento, where he got his start as a journalist, Vernon brought him to Bop City. And so you see in some of Herb Cain's columns in the 40s and 50s mention of Jimbo, who you see here in the front, um, and Bop City. Here's a picture of again, Louis Armstrong and his wife in front of um, a big mural of him, and then uh, a political slow thing in the background. I think they wanted Jimbo for mayor. This is... Um, uh, Paul Gonzalez. Paul Gonzalez of Duke Ellington's band. And actually, a, a, I'm not going to think of his name, but a well-known Filipino pianist in the background. So Flip Nunez. A, I'm sorry, go ahead. Flip Nunez. Yes, Flip Nunez. It really was a place, um, uh, John Handy and a number of other people said it was really a place where you came to prove yourself and to, and to develop as an artist. This is actually an interesting photograph. This is Teddy Edwards 
uh, with his girlfriend and another friend. And supposedly, if you could not cut it during the jam sessions, you were, there were a variety of ways that you were asked to leave. And the story we heard was that that saxophone player has just been asked to leave, and that's why he has that kind of ghost in the headlight <laughs> look. Um, they did not play, and, but it was a really a, a, where, a place where you could prove yourself and where you develop your skills. We were interested in this picture because um, uh, the jazz musicians, especially at that time, were pretty sexist. And we must have thought, well, I think Elizabeth knows who this is the um, wife or former wife of, do you remember? Uh, I don't remember. I, have to look <laughs> I'm sorry. Her name. I remember her, her first name is Judy. Yes. But she okay. was the former wife of a jazz musician. She must have been able to play or she would not have been able to get up on the bandstand. So that was actually, we were impressed by that. And there were not a lot of pictures. We, we have some pictures of all women groups during World War II because a lot of the musicians were, were not no longer around. But I think that ended when the war was over. Here's Chet Baker, um, who talked about, um, I think he was uh, in the military and he escaped and would come to Bob City. And that's uh, Max Roach, and we think it might be Ben Webster, Max Roach on the left, and maybe Ben Webster's third, the second from the third from the left. As you can see, it was like a place where people hung, as well as playing. Uh, we heard that the Rat Pack and the Frank Sinatra came, um, and here's Sammy Davis sitting in on the bongos. And Charlie Parker it was interesting in these clubs, they would have the names of uh, musicians and sports figures. And if one of them came into the club, you'd had to get up and because they could sit in the seat with their name on it. And I also want to point out that in uh, all these captions are in the book. So while our memories might be a little fuzzy, uh, please, if you purchase the book, you will be able to look at these photos um, that are in there and get the names of all these people who we are misremembering. Absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, sort of as a continuation of the, uh, although this is in the Sun Reporter, but uh, the, the powers that be were not really happy, A, about the fact that there were sort of mixed couples at some of these after hours places. And so Bob City was actually on the police blotter and got raided a lot. This is one from 1953. And, um, and as um, the economy changed and uh, the efforts to sort of um, uh, redevelop the area, the clubs started to um, either go for sale or were just closed without, um, you know, if people saw the writing on the wall. So what happened was is that redevelopment, as I mentioned earlier, um, they, in San Francisco, they started talking about redevelopment in the Fillmore District in the late 1940s. The first, very first house came down in 1953, and that was along Geary Boulevard. So that was the very first part of the Fillmore District to be redevelopment. And what they did was, Geary Boulevard was once just a street, uh, two lanes, just like Fillmore Street or any of the others around there. And they wanted to get people from the Sunset and Richmond District downtown as fast as possible. And so they felt that that area in the Western Edition was a hindrance to the fast conveyance of getting people from the outer areas of San Francisco to downtown. So they raised all the buildings that were on either side on Geary and widened it to what has been come known as the Geary Moat. So they, they put the um, four lane highway, for lack of a better way to describe it, underneath and then put Fillmore Street and other streets over it um, as a way to get people to downtown. Of course, this bisected the neighborhood and was the beginning of the demise of many of the businesses because it really cut off one part of the Fillmore neighborhood from the other and became somewhat of a dividing line. And in fact, uh, these days, it's been renamed on the side of, of Geary that goes up 
to um, California Street as the Lower Pacific Heights as a way to distinguish itself from the Fillmore neighborhood and a way to uh, make it more palatable to uh, potential buyers of properties there. So um, as you can see, the, the redevelopment agency, this is uh, again on Fillmore Street at Sutter, they walked around 20 square blocks of the neighborhood and documented every single building in the neighborhood. You can see the numbers up here. And those numbers corresponded to score sheets that they had. They had a two-page um, questionnaire filled out for every single building and rated things um, about each building uh, as far as like structurally if it was sound. And actually one of the ratings was if people of color lived in the building and they got demerit points for the more people of color who were living in the building, the lower the score. So that, again, tells you everything you need to know about where the uh, redevelopment agency and the powers that be heads were when they were thinking about redeveloping this neighborhood. Um, one of the things that happened from this, though, actually, it's interesting, was, well, A, it was the, the, the sort of mindset was that these Victorians were kind of rat traps and, and a product of old, of old age. But um, there was such an outcry because they were sort of torn down without any kind of review was that it, be, it led to the beginning of architectural preservation. You know, that, that now in a lot of parts of the country, if a building has some historical um, significance, it has to be vetted before anything can happen to it. And I think that was, that's the, what happened to the film where has been studied in kind of city planning all over the country. This is sort of at the point when everything was coming down pretty quickly. Right. This is, this is, that's Gary. And again, you'll see this is Gary right here before they dug it out and made the Gary Boulevard. And what, what also came out of this uh, terrible uh, redevelopment project and, and very poorly thought out redevelopment project was that it was the first time in the history of the United States that the courts ended up recognizing that people in the neighborhood, whether they own the building or, or were renters, had a right to have a say in what happened to their neighborhood. So when the redevelopment had divided the neighborhood project into two parts, A1 and A2, when A1 started in 1953, people really didn't know what to expect. You know, they were, they were told that this was going to be a good thing for them, that their buildings were going to be, you know, rebuilt in these amazing new modern uh, structures. But of course, they, once Geary was widened and they realized that it was actually causing the destruction of this vibrant neighborhood, they fought back and they created an organization called Waco, which actually sued the San Francisco city government as well as the redevelopment agency saying that they had no right to do this to the neighborhood without neighborhood in input. Judges agreed, but by then it was too late for most of the Fillmore neighborhood. The, as Lou mentioned earlier, one of the few things that happened was that the destruction of Victorians was stopped and instead they would put them on trucks and put them in, in other parts of the neighborhood where there were empty lots. But it did, um, it was an effective ruling because from that day forward, redevelopment agencies could no longer just come in, bulldoze a neighborhood down without uh, the neighborhood having input into what was going to happen. So it did, did uh, set this precedent that stands to this day. A lot of people, especially if you're a renter, just were asked to leave, although they, everybody was supposedly put on a list, and we've heard that maybe one family actually was able to come back. So a lot of these people moved to Daly City and to Hunters Point and to Oakland and different parts, uh, and many of them did not come back. Um, it's interesting that, so be, when Waco would stop that process, um, lots of parts of the film are looked like a war zone, were basically empty lots. And I actually just found this picture I took in the mid 70s of um, someone, of some people made a garden in one of those lots. 
um, so, so there was sort of some use because uh, everybody said that everybody left, and, but there were people kind of on the periphery and, and certainly people because of the sort of quality of life kind of reconnected. I remember seeing um, uh, concerts in some of these uh, fields. Um, so, uh, but it really was sort of nothing was happening and people were not moving back. Uh, one of the um, sort of results of that, this was that the building that we showed in the earlier picture looking down Fillmore. This was the Oddfellows Hall and it became the People's Temple and Jim Jones was a minister and many of the people that actually came to that church were a former residents of the Fillmore and offspring who were kind of looking for a spiritual and cultural connection that kind of from the void that had been left because they'd been displaced. And I think they, he actually was pretty well connected with the powers that be and the civil rights and he had a really good uh, reputation and sort of gradually started acting more and more bizarrely and ended up moving the whole con uh, sort of uh, congregation to uh, the Caribbean where eventually when he was they were discovered that he was exploiting people he had them commit mass suicide and I, I, my, um, I think we both agree that the sort of oppression of the Japanese being displaced the people leaving the South for economic opportunity, and then this community that was actually working being erased um, and led directly to the tragedy that happened with People's Temple, the, you know, the, the sort of forced mass suicide. It's, it's a really interesting, uh, tragic, horrible kind of set of connecting circumstances. But um, we, uh, find, Elizabeth and I had said we're going to do a book, and then finally we did. And um, this was the picture. This is a, a jam session at Jimbo's. On the left is John Handy. Next to him is Pointy Poindexter, who was a, a nationally known, li former local musician who became nationally known. Next to him is a very young John Coltrane. Um, Alice Coltrane, his widow, said that was the youngest picture she'd ever seen of him with a saxophone. And next to him is Frank Fisher who um, is actually my neighbor in Richmond and, and um, uh, uh, someone who's actually just stopped playing a little while ago. So we had, there was a, a, we did a version for Chronicle Books. And in the meantime, we got a lot of new information and uh, we had always wanted to kind of redo the book because we were not happy with some of the designs. I'm not sure I'm not even showing. So we were, we did a crowdfunding and were able to, um, I think we made 600 copies of this version, um, which we sold without any distribution. We sold it at events and locally. It was never even distributed uh, nationally. Um, and then, and this is John Coltrane. This is not John Coltrane. This is John Handy, thank you. Um, in front of one of the installations. Um, he's also someone who's been very supportive of it. Um, and he actually also talked about that idea of proving himself and learning his chops at the jam sessions at um, uh, Jimbo's. Here's Frank Fisher in his backyard with his flugelhorn. And here he is at one of the uh, book launches for at the African American Historical Society um, at the Art and Cultural Complex yeah, right off of on, uh, Fulton in the Fillmore. It's a picture of, of people from the um, Historical Society as well as uh, David Johnson, Frank Fisher, and John uh, Handy. Here's a picture of David and, uh, Johnson and Liz and I in front of a large blow up that, that picture that was at 1300, which was a, a success, a restaurant um, on Fillmore Street that opened um, and uh, unfortunately it's just closed not too long ago. So uh, this, we, this was an installation and in at that point was an empty um, building. And I remember there was an older gentleman who was, I saw in front of it and I went up to him and asked him what he thought about it. And he said that he lived not too far away and he came to look at this because it reminded him of the best time of his life. Um, and that's been a kind of recurring theme that people that lived uh, during the heyday of this time um, really appreciate the fact that because there was very little evidence of it, it was all in people's basements and, and uh, albums that um, it has now seen the light of day. 
And there is, a, that's 1300 behind, but there is a jazz festival every uh, year, except for this year, it was virtual on Fillmore Street. So there is, and there are um, banners on some of the street signs. So there is reference to that past, but um, if the neighborhood is not the same and the demographics are definitely not the same. This is a photograph that um, uh, Sonny Buxton and Willie Brown put together uh, of, of many of the jazz musicians from the period, uh, many of whom have passed almost immediately after it was taken. But um, they, uh, we were allowed to use this in later editions of the book because I thought it was a great sort of summing up of kind of the period and, and kind of what remained if people had survived. But this is the, you know, the remains. In fact, this sign is now completely gone that the Fillmore kind of had a little bit of a revitalization and then has, um, couldn't sustain it because there was not the uh, population to support the sort of restaurants and uh, institutions that were on the community and, and Reggie passed as well as a lot of other people. This was a, dim a uh, installation on that uh, bridge that goes over Geary on Fillmore uh, that Mildred Howard did and the city has actually allowed it to sort of be defaced and damaged and um, there's some efforts to either bring it back or take it away because I think it's sort of an insult to both the artist and to that heritage. So this, as you, as you saw before, this is a copy of the new book done by Heyday Books. Um, we were thrilled that they were interested in re-publishing. Re, uh, I guess that's not precedented. There's not a lot of publishing companies that would take a book that's already existed and redo it. And so we were thrilled. And we were, we were, we were thrilled because it, it, we were able to sort of maintain the incredibly proved, uh, improved uh, design that our, our um, colleague Steve Jones did um, and they did some things to is reproduced with more color reproductions and the quality is really strong and neither Elizabeth and I have to bring stacks of books to bookstores anymore which has been great it's so it's, it's available to people all over the world this was actually at the de Young Museum and this is Mayor London Breed who knew about the book and had the earlier copy and I made sure she had a copy of the new version. So there's there's both interest, uh, former Mayor Willie Brown is also very interested. And what I'm realizing from these photographs is I need to get a new hat <laughs> to wear my... So this is actually the, um, again, the website. Um, and I will, uh, I don't know if there's anything else you want to say at this point, Elizabeth? Um, just that on the website, we have put um, nearly all of the oral histories um, that were done for the book. There's a few more that still need to be put up. Um, mo all of them are in text form and some of them actually are in um, audio as well. So you can hear the people who we spoke with in their own voice uh, give a lot more information than what we could fit into the book. Um, so we also were able to put up all of the interviews Peter Stein did for the KQED documentary um, in text form. So it's a rich resource for anyone interested in learning more about the Fillmore neighborhood. Um, and so I strongly urge everyone to check out our website. And thank you for California Council for the Humanities for giving us a grant to create the website. And thank you to the California Historical Society for um, uh, allowing us to present this um, as we have been able to do. Thank you both so much. That was so interesting. I, um, I'm really struck by um, how the history of the Fillmore is sort of connective tissue for so many other stories. Um, I, I love how um, you mentioned that um, the, the fight against redevelopment sort of launched the preservation movement. Um, 
and actually organizations like um, one that I'm very familiar with, San Francisco Heritage, started because of that uh, in response to um, the fight against um, redevelopment there in the Western edition. And I also think about, um, you know, one of the reasons we wanted to do this program is because we have this collection at California Historical Society of Minor White, um, another photographer who is a teacher at the California School of Fine Arts, the San Francisco Art Institute, we know today. Um, and he photographed a little bit in the film war. He photographed all throughout the city. And so we're showing right now some of his photographs um, from the film war. But it's interesting to me because we also at the California Historical Society have the, um, uh, we were the court appointed repository for the people's, for the materials from People's Temple. And so it's, it's interesting, this story of the film where sort of fills in this space between People's Temple and these photographs that we have of Minor White. So it's just been, you know, there were a lot of threads there that I thought were really fascinating um, to think about. I was um, gonna say, My, Minor White uh, taught David uh, at the uh, Art Institute. Oh. And, and David said the advice he gave him was, Minor said, photograph what you know. And so that's why he, because uh, minor photographed in the film where as you said, but da David went to the neighborhood where he lived and that's what he did was to photograph what he knew, which I think, which he continued. Yeah, and I mean, minor white didn't go into the clubs as far as I know, you know, he was out on the street and so it's a totally, it's a, you know, now we're inside the clubs with, um, with the students. So that's great. I didn't know that. That's wonderful. Um, another connection. Um, I, it, and while we're on that subject, one of my questions, it actually brings me to one of my questions. Um, you know, you mentioned David Johnson and um, uh, is it Ricardo or Richard Alvarado? Ricardo Alvarado. Ricardo Alvarado and um, Jerry Stoll, of course, and then Steve Jackson. And I just, I, you know, and, and they each seemed to have a slightly different story. But I'm, as I was looking at the photographs, I was wondering, you know, were they, did the clubs hire photographers to go in there and take pictures of people? I mean, they had people like Lena Horn and Eartha Kitt and, you know, um, Ella Fitzgerald coming in. So was it in their interest to have photographers, to hire photographers, you know, the way that you might see a photographer hire, uh, for hire at a party now? Or, or were these people just doing this, or were these photographers mostly just doing this as their own um, work? I think both. Uh, we we heard stories about, they were all using, you know, speed graphics, and they would go to the clubs, photograph the performers and the patrons, go home, develop the film, make prints, and then come back at three or four in the morning and sell them. So the same day, um, they would do that. But like somebody like, uh, David probably did a little of that, but he was also just documenting life. And in his book, there's a lot even more pictures of people on the street and civil rights, um, you know, demonstrations and just... Um, so uh, some of the photographers who were self-taught and just did the clubs were hired and that's what they did. I mean, I think Steve, um, the, almost all the work he did was basically in Bob City and uh, although he was, you know, it turned out he was, had an incredible eye and really yeah. worked. Yeah. But I think there were a variety of agendas um, in terms of that. One of the things we were, we were talking about there are very few pictures inside churches. I guess the churches sort of thought photography was the devil's work, <laughs> which is <may or> very <laughs> interesting that, that some of the institutions were not documented, you know, that that was just not yeah. done or we, we've never been able to find. Them. Well, actually, that, that um, I, if I can step in here, uh, Steve actually had his own um, uh, photography studio for a while. Mm -hmm. um, but unfortunately, even David Johnson, Steve Jackson, uh, several other gentlemen, they weren't able to make this photography a go as a, a full-time career. Uh, David Johnson worked at uh, Mount Zion Hospital on Divisadero. Uh, Steve Jackson uh, worked for the post office for a while. So they were doing uh, a lot of their photography for the most part you know, after work, on the weekends, um, in the evenings. Um, also, uh, there actually is a robust collection of um, photography that was done in the churches in the Fillmore at the Shades of San Francisco in the Western Edition project oh, yeah. that the San Francisco Public Library had, where they did a call 
for the neighborhood to come to the Western Edition Public Library and bring photographs. Um, several of the churches showed up to that event. And uh, so they have a large collection of photos taken in the churches. But it seemed like um, the photographers that we connected with primarily focused um, their lenses in the clubs or street photography. And there was other photographers shooting um, in the churches and also with social institutions. Social clubs were very popular in the Fillmore in the 1940s and 50s. And it was uh, usually done groups of men or groups of women um, would have these social clubs where they would meet during the day, renting out some of the jazz clubs for their events, um, as well as raising money for various institutions um, within the Fillmore neighborhood. Mm -hmm. I was going to say also that I've heard stories that there was sort of full employment during the 40s, especially before and after the war. But in the 50s, when sort of there were economic downturns, one of the first places that was really affected was um, the, the Fillmore. And, and in fact, sort of crime increased and drug use uh, increased kind of simultaneous to that. And I would assume that there, because of that, that people could not sustain a living you know, just being photographers. And I'm sure it sort of coincided with the fact that the economy had changed. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's so interesting. And what should people do if they find um, photographs now? What can they do if they find photographs of the film more now? Um, uh, maybe give them to the California Historical Society. Or the <laughs> Maybe. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Okay. Fair enough. Or um, at the very least, they, they could scan them and uh, contact the Historical Society or contact us. I mean, we, we have continue still, uh, even just recently, were uh, contacted by someone that had several photographs of his father's club Blackshears, which was uh, on Fillmore and Post, and he has given me several of his father's photographs, uh, digital copies. So I really encourage people to do that because, you know, we never know if something might happen with the original photos, but if they're in a digital format, they're there for everyone to enjoy. And I think especially for a neighborhood like the Fillmore where so much historical information was lost because people were only given a um, couple weeks to at the most three months to move when the, when the redevelopment agency came and knocked on your door and said, you had to leave. If you were a renter, you were only given a couple weeks and given no assistance whatsoever um, with relocation. If you were a business owner, you were given a couple months. But nonetheless, you can imagine, as you saw with, for example, the Texas Playhouse, they had to get out of there quickly. And they were just you know, throwing things away and, and giving them to Red Powell at the Shine Parlor. So, so much material, ha it no longer exists. Yeah. So we really encourage people, especially in the Fillmore and Western Edition neighborhoods, if you have any kind of historical artifacts, um, newspapers, photos, even oral histories, please contact the California Historical Society or other um, historical institutions or even in the library. It's really important to save this history because as we've seen in San Francisco, it, history repeats itself and we still yes. don't seem to have learned the lessons that we should have learned from what happened to the Fillmore neighborhood. And what a great yeah. loss, what a great loss for our city and, in, and for our state to have this vibrant community completely torn apart and removed from the face of the earth. Yeah, can you talk, you showed one slide right at the end there of the sidewalk um, plaques, and it was, I love the picture because it's actually, um, it's right next to a, a, you know, hole in the cement for a, for a tree, but it's a, it happens to be a tree that's cut to the ground, so it, like, it, it kind of shows just how kind of inert this, um, this sign is as compared to the, to what it, 
represented. I think the one you showed was for Bop City. Can you talk a little bit about those sidewalk markers and like what mitigation efforts the city made, has made so far and what maybe could be well, done? Well, that, that actually was a result of the thing that I was hired to to do research for you know that the idea was you know different people probably at redevelopment agency that doesn't exist anymore but that there was an attempt probably due to pressure um from the community to make some reference well they wanted to sort of bring it back if possible but at least to make some reference that didn't exist to that history because like it really was literally erased yeah. and so um uh you know the book was not the book came from that initial, the book came from Elizabeth and I meeting, but um, I think the, the, if you walk along Fillmore, there are these signs, some of whom are in the wrong places, but signs acknowledging some of the personalities um, and the clubs uh, sort of approximately where they were that are kind of etched into the stone, which I think, you know, it was, I think that was a good gesture. And actually even more recently, there are now um, uh, banners. I should have. I, I've taken some pictures of them. Banners of people from the community and referencing the kind of jazz history of the neighborhood. And the you know the the jazz festival. It's usually the Fourth of July weekend attracts a whole bunch of people. And at one point, it was just in the Lower Pacific Heights, but it was expanded uh, due to pressure. Um, sort of into where the the clubs were and uh, you know thousands of people show up and there's like five or six stages it's it's kind of it's a really important cultural event although many of the institutions and sh shops and things are no longer in the neighborhood which is really unfortunate so I, have, yeah. I was actually hired by the redevelopment agency to do those those uh, things in the sidewalk and what, what, what was envisioned was not how it was executed. And it was enormously frustrating for me because it was done as many things are with the were done with, by the redevelopment agency with the best of intentions, but complete, co the execution was completely disastrous. So those, those uh, I created a list of all the buildings that I, felt should be honored and then also a list of people and then we had community meetings um, which turned into definitely quite the political uh, argument and so there was much fighting going back and forth between the people that were in those community meetings about who should be honored and who should be not um, and what was supposed to happen with those is that you were supposed to be able to walk down the street and you would see them as you walk down the street and there was supposed to be a little booklet that corresponded with each uh, thing in the sidewalk. Um, mm -hmm. And unfortunately that part never happened and they put the blocks in wrong so you actually have to you don't see them as you walk they're sideways and so you kind of have to turn and stop and look um <laughs> so it was a bit, of, a bit of a mess and i think uh yet another example of just everything the redevelopment agency tried to do in that neighborhood never ever worked Hmm. And either, making either, it go away, right? Except, except right. making it go away, making it disappear. Right. Um, but are there are there effort are there continuing discussions about um, the district and you know honoring its history or or things like that? I'm are there still discussions about that at all, or or is that kind of over? I'm I'm in touch with um, uh, uh, someone who actually had a a shop there who's the head actually of both the Fillmore Merchants Association and a number of other ones. And I know they're very interested in kind of making sure that the heritage is continued to be acknowledged, um, you know, in ways that they can. I mean, so there, there are efforts to do that. But I think it's difficult because the sort of, many of the players are no longer with us or they're certainly no longer in the neighborhood. And But I think it's, um, uh, I think one thing about San Francisco, and I think that's why, the historical society has done so well is that San Francisco the, the past or reference to the past is is important to enough residents of the city that um, they don't lay allow things to just just you know go away without yeah. either consequences or trying to make make sure there's some reference. 
I also think it's really the, you know, that we can talk about the neighborhood, but also I just think about the people and, you know, so much this year we've talked about kind of the legacy, um, you know, the legacy of privilege. I'm not saying, the, saying this quite right, but, um, um, you know, kind of institutionalized race, racism and the way that, um, you know, things like redlining have had generational effects. And I just think about, you know, um, Leola King, did I say her name right? Leola King and her, I don't know if she had a family, but you know, the legacy of her losing her wealth, um, the loss of generational wealth is what I'm talking about. And I just, I feel like, you know, there's also this aspect where the people, where there's a whole generation of people that didn't benefit from the thriving of the thing that their predecessors built, you know, and it's, uh, Hard to think the, about that. The, the African American population of the city of San Francisco has been declining probably for the last 20 years and more rapidly recently uh, because of economic factors, just that yeah. people can't afford to live here. And so that is reality. And, and, um, and uh, I'm not sure what can be done about that, but that is absolutely the truth. And I think there are efforts in in neighborhoods like Hunter's Point and other places to sort of try to fight that, you know, and to at least try to mitigate gentrification, which is inevitable. But I think um, it's, you know, it's happening in the mission, it's happening in a lot of other areas. And I think that, uh, oops. <laughs> uh, yeah, it's, it's, it's an issue, uh, in this case, an issue where the sort of economic thriving is not benefiting people across the board, for sure. Yeah. Well, and also you think about um, the, the easiest way to wealth in this country traditionally has always been by owning your own home and owning property. So you had all these people coming from the South to work in the shipyards. They, they work their tails off. They save up money to finally buy a house or a flat in the Fillmore District. Plus you have people coming back from the concentration camps, Japanese Americans coming back to the Fillmore and everyone's finally doing okay. You know, we're back from the camps, we're from, you know, settled in from the South. We own our house for the first time in our lives. And then you have some guy come and knock on your door and tell you, we don't care here's money that's not even close to what your property is worth get the hell out of here yeah. how do you ever economically recover that and not only economically but emotionally mm -hmm. the emotional toll of not being able to control your own life or where you live you're simply told to get the hell out of there i think has created an enormous pain for many people from the film war and as lou pointed out to the point where they turn to the people's temple to try and bring back some of that sense of community that they once had in the Fillmore. So there's a lot, the redevelopment agency has a lot to answer for. Yeah. And I don't think that anyone has really talked about addressing um, compensation, fair compensation for mm -hmm. the people that lost everything during the San Francisco redevelopment of the Fillmore District. Yeah. Well, it's a, it's a tough issue. I really, yeah, I hope that those conversations continue. Um, you know, I just, before we end here, I just want to ask, um, on your website, can people um, find other resources? It seems like I just am really struck by how important your book is in kind of gathering a lot of this information together because like with the loss of the neighborhood, you know, you, there's just so many losses, they just keep mounting. And so it seems that, you know, bringing, bringing the information together um, and having resources like your book um, is really important. So I'm just wondering if on your website you have a list of other resources or if there's, I guess in the book you probably have other resources for people who are interested in this subject and wanna um, learn more about the Fillmore and about the jazz scene, is that right? Yes, both in the book and on the website, we yeah. have okay. additional okay. information. Yeah. And we encourage anyone that has um, any corrections, any identification of people in the photographs, any more information, please email us. Um, our contacts are on the website and um, we welcome it. It's, this has a, been a group effort. I mean, Lou and I have been the gatherers, but it really has taken um, 
an entire community to make this book happen. So we're grateful for everyone that is, has participated so far. Yeah. And almost every time we show work, someone will say, oh, that's my auntie, or oh, that's so-and-so. I mean, it really is um, a kind of way to generate um, things that either had been forgotten or maybe that people didn't even know about. I, I have a good friend who grew up in the Fillmore, and there's a picture of his father in Jimbo's Waffle House that he had never seen before. And we were in New York, and he's looking through and stops dead, and, and that's mm -hmm. sort of that kind of reactions happen a lot of times. Yeah. Well, I think there's a lot of um, joy in the book and a lot of sadness. So I just, but I think I really appreciate the both sides of that in the book. So um, I'd like to thank you both so much for joining us. And um, I really appreciate it. And we'll put up some information about um, how to get the book after this. Thanks. Thank you.